All right. Looks like we're live. Hi, everybody. It's just about 10 a.m., 9.59 on um, Tuesday, July 25th. So welcome to another Tuesday, another hot July Tuesday here in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I know many of you tune in from other parts of the country, and I know it's much, much hotter where you are, so we don't have it too bad here. Um, all right. I want to uh, just go over the format a little bit. I want to remind you, if you're just joining us on YouTube, to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button. That way that you make sure that um, you're notified of uh, all new videos. Uh, we're going to go through our slot update today um, first, and that's a, that'll be about 15 minutes. And we're going to talk about market updates and some analyst reports, and that's about 15 minutes. And our financial planning topic uh, today starts a four-part series and that four-part series is called How to Get to Zero. So uh, one of our focuses here at Attleboro Wealth, and if you don't know me, my name is Mark Bilek. I'm a certified financial planner, and I focus on tax-efficient strategies as one of my specializations. So a lot of tax-efficient uh, strategies has to do with getting people to a much lower or a um, zero tax bracket in retirement. And people often say, well, how do you get that? How do you get there? I met with... Um, some longer term clients uh, a week or two ago, and we were showing them and their plan, their financial plan, how they achieve um, the zero rate in about five years. And they said, geez, uh, we never thought we'd really get there. And uh, and it's good to see. It's good to see folks doing that. But people can. Not everybody can, but you might be able to. And we're going to go through the steps um, that it takes to get there. So in this first step, we're going to talk about Roth contributions and Roth conversions. Roth IRAs and Roth retirement plans are a vital key. It's not the only thing to use to get you there, but it's a vital key uh, item for the tax efficient planning. So we're going to spend some time on that today. And that's probably the largest portion of this segment. Um, but again, four parts. We have part, part one, Roth contributions and Roth conversions. Part two, taxable accounts. Those accounts held outside of IRAs. Uh, whether they be tax deferred accounts or uh, traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs. So uh, accounts held outside of those traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs, that's what we call taxable accounts. Part three will be pensions. So these, these are going to be in subsequent weeks. Part three will be pensions. What do you do if you have a pension? How do you handle that? How do you how you how do you balance between do I take a lump sum distribution or do I take my lifetime payments? my annuity payments out of the pensions. So we'll go over that. Part four is social security. What is the taxation of my social security? How does that, how is, how does it affect my taxes? This will not be a discussion about the best time to take social security. That's a whole other topic. And we've covered that before, but um, we're going to talk about how social security all plays into getting to the zero tax. So it's a big, big topic. We're breaking it down over four weeks. So we hope you appreciate that. Um, Okay, we looks like everything's running well. Uh, okay, I want to, you know, I just uh, I was off yesterday. If if you're a client, and you were trying to reach us, you got a um, or reach me in particular. You got an out of office email, and I just wanted to bring it up. I had the pleasure again to for the eighth year in a row to ride um, to the Bend to the Shore bike ride that goes from Center City, Philadelphia to Atlantic City, New Jersey. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. I'm just proud of our team. We have a team called the Bucks Heroes. So we've got about 100 people on the team now. Um, and they're made up of police and fire and EMTs and dispatchers and attorneys and prosecutors and just everybody who really comes together together to support our first responders. And the entire charity, the Families Behind the Badge charity uh, based in Philadelphia raises money for fallen children of or family members, raises money for family members of fallen first responders. Um, so we raise over a million dollars a year. I think we hit $1.2 million this year collectively, all of us. It's a lot of fun. It's a long, hot ride, right? 65 miles in July. It's always in July. Uh, this year was much better and much cooler than last year, so I'm not complaining, but uh, we've got a great group. It's a lot of fun, and I appreciate everybody out there who's supported us. So thank you for that. Let's see here. We're going to talk about some slot updates. So what do I mean by slot updates? These are the updates we get on a regular basis. I get many of these a week um, from the Ed Slot Group. And these are timely updates. Either we receive questions from folks around the country uh, with, uh, and I'll read these mailbag questions uh, or 
uh, some of the analysts put out just um, updates to keep us informed. The uh, Ed Slack group is really an education and resource group, and uh, it's the best in the country. I think it's the only one like it in the entire country. As I've told you, um, there's only about 400 or so of us in the country who are part of this, and and I'm proud to be part of that, and, and I'm proud to be on Ed's board, uh, advisory board as well. So um, let's start with, and I always share these with you, so let's do that because it's a little easier to read along. Okay, we're going to try something a little different with my panel because I continue to, uh, all right, we're going to switch here. We're going to put me back up here because uh, I sometimes I cut I cut something off, but I think it's going to be worse in the bottom left for this these purposes. So this first question is backdoor Roth IRAs and beneficiary RMDs. And this is uh, answered by Ian Berger. You all have met Ian before. Ian before. Uh, it's funny, this backdoor Roth IRA, I was just talking to a woman. I think she was from Texas. I think that's where it was last week. And uh, she she called, uh, she reached out to us with a question. And uh, she was, she had just read some tax planning books and had had saw some of our videos. And, and she said, um, uh, she's going through all the different things she's changing. And like everyone, she said, geez, I wish I would have heard of this 20 years ago. But um, she's heard of it now, so that's really great. And um, so she was talking about all these different ways that she can uh, transfer money, and we're going to talk about it, some of them today, into um, tax-efficient strategies like a Roth IRA, cash value life insurance. And she, I, I talked to her about the backdoor Roth contribution, so that's making a non-deductible IRA contribution and immediately converting that money to a Roth IRA. So that's acceptable. The IRS uh, allows it. Uh, they did not restrict it in the last um, the last changes to the SECURE Act, which was a, a really good win for us. Uh, there are some things, of course, to pay attention to. We have a video about that as well. But, um, you know, even people who are learning about these things forget about these um, great tools like a backdoor Roth contribution. So let's jump into this. Uh, this person writes, I have a question regarding solo 401ks. Does a solo 401k contribution affect the pro rata rule when considering a backdoor Roth IRA? That's James. And the answer is no. 401k assets are disregarded for the pro rata rule on a backdoor Roth. That rule only takes into account traditional IRAs, both pre-tax and after-tax, and SEP and simple IRAs. So the pro rata rule is a complex rule, um, but if I can put it simply, if you have any money in IRAs that are listed here, so traditional IRAs, SEP, and simple IRAs, it all gets counted together. So if you do a non-deductible IRA contribution into an IRA and try, let's say you did $7,500, you were over 50 and you want to do $7,500 and you think you can move that directly to a uh, Roth IRA as a conversion, let's say you earn too much to do a direct Roth contribution. That's why people do these things. If we do uh, if you have a, if you cannot do a, a regular contribution into directly into a Roth IRA, then you may be able to do what's called a backdoor Roth IRA, where you do a non-deductible contribution and you move that money right over. But you have to be really careful because if you have existing funds in a traditional IRA, like Ian writes here, a traditional IRA, a SEP, and that's both pre-tax and after-tax, a SEP IRA and simple IRA then there's a calculation that has to be done to determine how much of that conversion you just did, that $7,500 non-deductible contribution into a traditional IRA, then an immediate conversion into a Roth IRA. There's a calculation that has to be done to tell you how much of that conversion is tax-free and how much of it is taxable. So be careful with that. I know it's confusing, but um, there are we have an in-depth video about backdoor Roth IRAs. Next question, it, Roth contribution, backdoor Roth IRA contributions. Um, the next question, my question is in regard to RMDs under the SECURE Act for designated beneficiaries, adult children, inheriting an IRA during the death of a parent. Here's the example. Mom passed away. Let me make sure I'm not cutting us off. Mom passed away at age 61. She had not reached her required beginning date for her own RMDs. I'm down here. Can the adult children let the monies accrue in her inherited IRAs for 10 years and then close the accounts at the end of the 10th year, or must they start taking annual RMD distributions and then close the accounts at the end of the 10th year after the death of the parent? So when this person says close the accounts, he's talking about a full distribution of the account. It's not 
It's not really closing the account, right? You can always keep it open, but you want full distribution of the um, of the distribution. So don't let that terminology confuse you. It's it's full distribution must be done. It's really a final required minimum distribution. So the question is, if if the adult or if the person who passed had not started taking required minimum distributions, must they? Uh, must the the folks who inherited it? If they're not an eligible designated beneficiary, continue to take, um, or must they take required minimum distributions or does just distribute the funds at the end of the 10 year? Really common and really, really great question. And the answer is, um, Thomas, the IRS published uh, proposed secure act regulations in February, 2022. Those regulations say that certain beneficiaries subject to the 10 year rule must empty the inherited IRA by the end of the 10th year after the year of death and take annual RMDs in years one through 10 of the 10 year period. However, the annual RMD requirement only applies if the IRA owner dies on or after his or her RMD required beginning date, generally April 1st of the year following the year he or she turns 73. I'm right here. In your example, mom died before her required beginning date, so the children are not required to take annual RMDs within the 10-year period. So Sarah Brenner um, very creatively said, think of the Rolling Stones song, you start me up. Once you start, you never stop. And once it start, it don't stop. Um, and that's really how it goes. If, if, if it hasn't started, if, if the owner of the IRA has not been required to take distributions, then the, the inherited non-eligible designated beneficiaries also don't have to take uh, required minimum distributions, but the, the the account, they must follow the 10 year rule. The account has to be fully depleted by the end of 10, 10th year. Yes, of course they can take distributions, right? These are required minimum distributions. I do get that question from time to time. Well, I want to take distributions. Well, that's fine. You can. Um, and I think that covers that. All right. Now the next topic is trust as a beneficiary, potentially catastrophic problem. Uh, you know, this is from my friend Andy, and uh, I, I, I do know that Andy likes to make things, or, you know, often works to make things um, more uh, entertaining. I, I don't know if I'd call it a catastrophic problem, but I'd call it something to watch out for. So prior to the SECURE Act in 2020, we used to do a lot of work around naming trusts as beneficiaries. And, this, and just like the, the um, just like previous uh, law, um, uh, and regulations got rid of the stretch IRA, the Secure Act um, really just blew out of the water the most of the uses of uh, trust as beneficiaries. So let's talk about that. We say in our training manual. So what what Andy's uh, um, speaking about is the manuals that we get, the thick manuals. I'm holding my hand up. If you're listening, uh, just on YouTube, I'm holding my my hand my my uh, my hand up to show a thick. Um, manual size. And we get these when we go to our training events. Um, so we go through issues like updates to the SECURE Act, just reminders of things like uh, beneficiary designations and different checklists we use. And uh, of course, new tax law updates, but uh, that's what um, that's what Andy's talking about with the manual. So he says in our training man, or we say in our training manuals that the SECURE Act obliterates IRA trust planning. That's an aggressive word, obliterates, but it, it is accurate. We also shout from the mountaintop that every trust created prior to the SECURE Act was and named as an IRA beneficiary must be reviewed, potentially rewritten. There are reasons still to have a trust as a beneficiary or just scrapped altogether. What was a perfectly effective planning strategy a couple of years ago could totally be totally useless now, and here's why. So here's his example. The year is 2018, two years prior to the SECURE Act, and all living IRA beneficiaries are still allowed to stretch the annual required minimum distribution. So Andy just answered my question. It wasn't the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that got rid of the RMD, the stretch option for the RMD. It was the SECURE Act. So I should have remembered that, but that's okay. Um, John, age 60, has a $2 million IRA. His wife predeceased him, and his only heir is his son, Billy, age 25. Billy is a terror and has an extreme gambling addiction. John wants to leave his IRA to Billy, but he cannot trust that Billy will be anywhere near responsible with the money. So that's what we call a spendthrift issue, right? Billy is not good with his money. He's, he's got spendthrift issues. So that's a perfectly good reason for a trust. So John decides to name a trust as his 
IRA beneficiary. With Billy as the sole trust beneficiary, the trust language dictates that only RMDs are to be paid to Billy based on Billy's single life expectancy. With a trust as beneficiary, Billy is precluded from invading the account. Robert rests easy knowing he will provide Billy annual income for life while still protecting the $2 million from getting burned down at a casino over a long weekend. Fast forward to 2020, the SECURE Act has been passed and stretch RMD payments are eliminated from most beneficiaries other than eligible designated beneficiaries. The 10-year rule is created. John does not update his trust or review any of his state planning goals. How often should you review those goals, folks? I'm just going to let that be out there, but it, please, you can type it in your into your chat. How often should you repl- review your financial plan, uh, including, of course, your goals and objectives? How often? The original trust with its original language remains the beneficiary of John's $2 million IRA, and Billy is still a terror. It is late 2020, and John dies. I'm just pulling this up here. Upon reviewing the IRA beneficiary form, it's determined the trust is the beneficiary. As such, a trust-owned inherited IRA is created with Billy as the beneficiary of the trust. The custodian properly identifies Billy as a non-eligible designated beneficiary and correctly determines the 10-year rule applies. John was only 62 when he died and was not yet taking RMDs. Once it's Once it starts, it can't stop, but you also don't have to take distributions. Um, uh, do, if if the person is prior to the required beginning date. Now, this is where it gets interesting with this trust language, because if this um, if you inherit the money directly outside of a trust, you have an option of taking distributions, um, even if you're not in, uh, in, in the requirement window for the required minimum distributions. But what about a trust? John was only 62 when he died and was not yet taking RMDs. We're back here again. Consequently, the trust-owned inherited IRA will not have RMDs in years one through nine of the 10-year rule. So they don't have – They uh, an individual could take distributions, but there are no RMDs if the decedent's IRA or the decedent's, decedent hadn't reached required beginning date. The now antiquated language of the trust created just two years previous dictates that only RMDs are to be paid out of the inherited IRA. That is not uncommon. The custodian and trustee of the trust follow the legal language of the trust precisely as they should. There are no RMDs in year one through nine. So so for nine years, the inherited IRA just sits there untouched. But at the end of year 10, the SECURE Act dictates that whatever remains in the account must be distributed. This is essentially the final RMD, as I mentioned earlier. Since the trust language says to only pay out RMDs and since the final payment in year 10 is considered the final RMD, the trust has no choice but to pay a lump sum distribution of the entire inherited IRA to the trust and then distribute those dollars to the trust beneficiary. Had John reviewed the Trust Post-Secure Act, he could have avoided this catastrophic scenario and designated an alternative beneficiary plan. Instead, 10 years after his death, John spins in his grave while multimillionaire Billy, the kid, hoots and hollers all the way to Vegas to see Andy does like to keep it interesting. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways that that issue could be avoided. Um, you This is why you want to review those documents every single year, every single year. Review your plan every year. All right. That was really helpful. I hope that was really helpful. Let's talk a little bit about the markets. So, um in uh, looking at last week, so we had some um, some reporting numbers. So retail sales, the Commerce Department reported that retail sales increased 0.2 percent last month versus the one half of percent gain expected. So increased less than expected. While the previous month's gain was revised to 0.5 percent from uh, 0.3, core retail sales, which exclude autos, gas, building materials, and food service, increased. 0.6% over the previous month. And so what does this mean? Uh, consumer health has been key to the resilience of the U.S. economy and appears to be continuing. Although it may be softening a bit, uh, this report is not adjusted for inflation. And given the 0.2% gain in um, consumer price index last month, real retail sales were close to flat. So considering inflation, the retail sales, that, that you know, that uh, 0.2 that we expect it, um, that's really month to month inflation last year. So the sales were flat for that period of time. 
So uh, then we looked at housing starts. Uh, the housing starts fell 8% month over month, while May's starts were revised lower. Building permits were down 3.7 month over month and down 15.3% year over year. So from this time last year to, to th this report, um, the permits, building permits were down 15.3%. So what does that mean? Housing starts reversed some of May's surprising gains, suggesting that builders are taking tentative steps forward, but remain cautious in the face of higher interest rates. Of course, builders often, almost always borrow money to build projects. And as interest rates go up, it gets more expensive and the return on investment is not as attractive. Inventory of homes available to buy uh, continue to be relatively low as a result. We also have an index of leading economic indicators, or the LEI. That fell by 0.7% in June after a 0.6% drop in May, making it the 15th consecutive monthly decline. So for the six-month period ending June 2023, the index is down 4.2%, which is a steeper rate of decline than the previous six-month period ended December 2022 of 3.8%. So what does that mean? Um, that indicator continues to point towards a recession and not necessarily a shallow one. So a deeper recession, if we're just looking at that indicator, given the length and magnitude of the decline, but the economy continues to push back. We don't want the bet against history, but just because a recession hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't. But for now, the bulls, so the folks who think the market's going to continue and uh, to go up and the economy is going to continue to grow rapidly. Um, so, but for now, the bulls are in charge behind a resilient economy. So what's coming up this week? Well, we got the Fed meeting on, on tomorrow, Wednesday, um, and they're expected to raise rates again a quarter of a point after pausing last month. So we'll see what happens. And then um, the um, the PCE index is on Friday, and that's that's what the um, – that's one of the indicators the Fed wants to uh, likes to look at to determine uh, what they should do, uh, and uh, you know as far as interest rate hikes, um, because it, it's a good indicator of what we're going to see in the future, the next next monthly reporting for inflation. So let's talk about the markets last week. Dow Jones was up slightly, two percent, two point one three percent. It's up seven point five four percent for the year. Uh, one year period, or year over year, this time last year to this year, um, it's 12.35%. Uh, the S&P 500 was up slightly, 0.7%, um, still up 19.22%. I think everybody's surprised that we're seeing, we're, we're at nearly, well, just over 19% for the S&P 500. The NASDAQ is up over 34% for the year. I think everybody's surprised by that. You know, historically, the um, when you have a, a down year, uh, a previous down year like we did in 2022, we can see a bump in the um, in the following year for sure. And we we see that historically. But, you know, um, all these economic indicators, again, are just pushing against that. You know? um, and for whatever reason, the market continues to be resilient. And that, um, you know, you should be, I as I always say, defensively optimistic that we don't want to sit on the sidelines and miss these things. Um, but we want to make sure that our needs are in order. I hope that's helpful. Uh, so everything was pretty mixed across the board as far as the stock markets. Um, the uh, bond markets were up slightly. The U.S. aggregate bond index was up 0.01%. Uh, That's very slightly. The shorter term, the, the um, one to three year bond um, index was down slightly, 0 0.03. So um, still, they're they're positive for the year, 2.3% and 1.52%. Uh, so that's where we were last year, obviously, or, or last week, excuse me, the Fed funds. Um, Target is, of course, still at 5.25. We'll find out tomorrow if they're going to raise that again. Um, Six-month treasuries were up just slightly from 5.43% to 5.45%. And the three-month treasury, uh, which is the one we tend to be using right now, is at about 5.29 or 27%. All right. Just check our screen here. Uh, the Wall Street Journal just had an interesting little tidbit here, and they talked about different index performance. A few weeks ago, we went over what the different indices are and how they're calculated and, and how they're structured and why they report so differently. So they talked about the S&P 500 being up 19% the, this year. And they write, even as analysts expect 2023 corporate earnings to barely inch up, some investors see reasons for concern, including worrying economic signals, lofty equi equity valuations, so that's stock valuations, lofty stock valuations, and the possibility that the Fed continues raising interest rates or keeps them elevated longer than the market anticipates. So that's a really, really nice way of saying 
um, there's there they're seeing concerns that nothing's making sense, right? We have um, these uh, concerning reports. We we see housing uh, starts drop. We we uh, retail sales are flat. Um, we're not seeing. Um, uh, you know, we we still see uh, wages increase, things like that, and um, and interest rates continue to to rise. There's really, you know, the, the Fed did pause, but they're going to continue to raise rates until it comes under control. And uh, you know, everything, as we said earlier, still pointing towards a recession historically. So the question is, um, how much longer can this can this go? BlackRock says. Uh, what we're changing in portfolios. I thought this was interesting. They're moving overweight U.S. stocks, but trimming tech as the market breadth uh, potentially widens. So what does that mean? So um, the uh, tech's had a really nice run so far this year. So they're trimming that a bit. Um, this is tactical. I'm not recommending that you do these things. I'm just sh I'm just sharing with you uh, what some of the analysts and what some of the larger – BlackRock is the largest investment management firm in the world. So what these folks are doing – um, and again, don't follow BlackRock to the T. They've made some horrible bets along uh, over the years, but they've um, they've done some good things too. So, two balancing U.S. growth exposure by increasing value bets in uh, Europe uh, and moving up in credit quality um, are three of their items that they're going forward with right now. So, moving overweight U.S. stocks, um, but trimming tech, balancing U.S. growth exposure by increasing value bets in Europe. So value, uh, there are value stocks and, and they're talking about stocks here. Um, value stocks are growth stocks. Growth stocks are stocks that we continue, we expect to continue to grow. Um, and uh, they typically have very low dividends or no dividends. Value stocks are companies that are determined to be undervalued. Um, so they, they do tend to swing. Sometimes value will out, outperform growth and um, growth will outperform value. So growth has um, very much outperformed value so far this year. So it looks like BlackRock is kind of taking some of the money off the table and saying, all right, now we're going to um, uh, up, you know, start, start padding our value holdings in Europe. Okay. All right. And that's it for the markets today. And Kathy said about reviewing plans, review every year, but thinking also of a significant life event occurs or is expected. That's true. Of course, that's a good, good um, mention there, Kathy. So yeah, I always say you, you should review your plan every year, but of course you should do it. If you have a major change in your life or expect a major change in your life, you should absolutely uh, review your plan. Beneficiary designations. You know, we had somebody who recently who had some, um, not good medical news. So one of the first things that the team does is they dig in and look at the plan and they they um, they look at beneficiary designations. It's very, very important. Okay, we're going to switch over now. We're going to switch over to our financial planning topic, uh, the financial 15. Um, and let me change my, let's see how this is going to work. I think this is going to work better on if I'm down at the bottom left here. But the topic is how to get the zero tax the objective, zero tax, or as close as possible. Not everybody can get the zero tax, but many, many people can. You just have to identify the roadblocks and figure out how to handle it. Today, we're going to talk about uh, part one, Roth IRAs and Roth retirement plans. Um, so let me just give you, we're going we're gonna to use a little bit of an um, example here. So many of you have met these folks before. This is an example. Um, just as we kind of build this out, I, I want it. Th this is a real world example of a, of a client we worked with many years ago and where they started. We've made it some adjustments along the way, given, given different, um, different changes in the tax code. But, uh, but at the time, the, the, and these aren't their real names, obviously, but John and Mary, they're 61 and 60 years old. They want to retire at 66 and 65. Their current income, uh, is $160,000. What they need to spend, all these things are important to know, of course, what they need to spend is $84,000 a year, uh, $7,000 a month. That, of course, is after tax, right? That's the money that they need to spend. They're expecting about $43,000 at their full retirement age. So that's something that's higher now. Um, they want to buy a condo at, uh, at, a, at about age 66 when they retire. 
at 175,000, we have so many clients doing, you know, looking to do this. They're looking all over the country. They're they're trying to, you know, Florida has become expensive for insurance reasons and things like that, and even the cost of um, of properties. But that's a really common goal. And so is this, by the way. They want to give some kind of gift of a um, to help their kids. And at this this point, they're saying at about uh, age 70, $25,000. And here are their, um, their investments as they stand. They have a million dollars in an IRA. They have $350,000 in a taxable account, right? So that's anything outside of an IRA, not a traditional IRA or not a Roth IRA, not a traditional 401k or a Roth 401k or retirement plan. So that's what lives outside of that. Uh, John has a 401k and he, and he um, contributes 10, uh, 10% of his income, but he gets no match. And they have some term life insurance and some long-term care insurance. So what's the goal here? Okay, get John and, and Mary to zero if possible. And if we can do that, we want to see what the net effect is. So what I'm showing you here is an example of our before and after comparison. Because I like to show this first because this is a lot of work. It's a lot to take in. Often at times, it's a lot of relearning. We hear we've learned kind of the wrong way for 40 years. Now we have to revisit this and learn how to do things all over again, save in Roth IRAs, uh, convert to Roth IRAs. If life insurance is part of your plan, you know, all these, it, all these uh, steps and it can take a lot of work. So you, you've got to be uh, incentivized, right? So what's the incentive? I get it. Zero tax sounds good, but what does it mean from a dollar point of view? So here's what it meant for John and Sally. Um, you'll see here, I'm just going to briefly explain this to you. Strategy one, taxes double. Taxes double and you do nothing. Strategy two, taxes stay the same and you do nothing. Strategy three, taxes double, but you take steps to be tax efficient. So let's look at it. So at about, we'll see the, the age down there, but about age, uh, what's it, about 86 or 87 years old, uh, they're, they're at risk of running out of money. Now, this is not financial planning. This is just a side-by-side -side comparison. All investment and um, inflation assumptions are the same in each strategy, so it, it all runs along the same. Um, but they're, they're at risk of running out of money. If taxes stay the same, which we all know can happen, we expect taxes to double by um, around uh, year 2030. There's, again, some good videos to explain that. I'm not going to go over it today. But even if taxes don't double, there's still a significant difference between zero and at age 100, this is $2.2 million. So that's a good incentive to me. For me as a planner, if I can help a client have $2.2 million at age 100 um, that they could pass to their heirs or they could spend during their lifetime, well, that's a win. That's worth all this work. Now, that's this is net worth, right? So this is before tax. Um, we do focus on wealth to heirs. And this is essentially an after-tax number, so that's good. They're still at zero here at age 100. And well, actually, they're at potentially zero in their 80s here between 80 and 90, um, but they're still, if they're tax efficient, if taxes double and they do things a little differently to be tax efficient, then they're at $2.2 million. Now I'm going through this quickly only because it's a lot of information. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but now I want to just touch on age 100 because people say, well, wait a minute, Mark, age 100, that's a long time away. I don't want to wait till age 100 to see a benefit of this. And I don't know if I'm going to be here. I don't know if I'm going to know or care. So we want to look at different times. So I'm going to just zero in on a few different numbers here for you. So what this is showing is the projected amount using a very, very simple comparison. Again, not financial planning, just a very simple comparison at age 85. So is everybody with me at this age 85? So at age 85, John and Sally are spending $170,000 a year. They haven't run out of money yet but they potentially do here where it's red and all they have then is really their social security. Um, so the uh, let's look over here at these different, at, at these different um, uh, numbers here. So what this shows is that before tax that John has uh, John and Sally have about $2.4 million if they're tax efficient. If uh, from an after tax number, they're at, uh, 2.63. Now, why is that different? Because they're able to use life insurance and there's a little bit of death benefit here. And again, I know this is confusing, but what I want to compare is these two, because this is an after tax, um, excuse me, before tax number, but before 
life insurance, and it's it's pretty spot on. So at age 85, let me just make this section bigger for you. The difference to them is just about $2 million. $2 million. So what does that mean? This is the money if taxes double and they do nothing, what they're likely to have left at age 85. Most of us believe that one of you, if you're a, if you're a spouse or maybe even yourself, that one of you is going to be here at age 85. They might not believe age 100, but most com- most people are comfortable with age 85. So you have to ask yourself, if you have the potential just by doing things a little bit differently, not taking more investment risk, not spending less money, you'll see over here we're spending the same amounts of money for John and Sally all the, the time along. And I know this there's a lot going on here, and I'm going through it quickly because I don't want to take the time away from the Roth conversation with this. But if you just take away from this snapshot here that if John and Sally do things a little bit differently, they've got either they've got $2.4 million to spend rather than $478,000. And of course, it gets better because at, uh, at what would that be? That's age 88, this one here. This is when they're at zero. Zero is no good compared to $2.4 million. So now we're at plus $2.4 million. And that's either $2.4 million they can pass to their kids. It would actually be more than that. It'd be $2.5 million because again, if they're able to use insurance, there's a death benefit involved there. Death benefit Hope I'm not cutting me off, cutting us off. Um, if not, uh, they can spend it. What can they spend it on? Well, anything that they want, they can spend it on long-term care if they need it. They can spend it on more vacationing if they're really, you know, active 85-year-olds. There's plenty of them out there. But it, isn't it better to have an extra $2 million at age 85 than to basically give it to the government? That's the, that's that's essentially the difference. So um, that's the that's the goal, right? So now we've identified the, I always say, is the view worth the climb? Now we've identified the view. Well, well, hey, for all this work we're doing, all this climbing, we're going to get to a view of potentially $2 million more for us to spend or leave to our heirs um, just by doing things a little bit differently. So the first thing that we want to do differently is we want to take advantage of, let's go back up to the top here and find our Roth all right, so we know what everything that they have there. Oh, here, yeah, I put there, we use our buckets, right? So these are our taxable buckets. So this is anything that's not in an IRA, not in a traditional IRA, not in a Roth IRA, not in a, um, a, uh, a 401k or other tax deferred or Roth um, uh, retirement account. So this is anything you get 1099s on. And you get these every year for interest, capital gains, whether they're short-term gains or long-term gains. Um, uh, uh, dividends, etc. So this is the taxable bucket. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about tax advantaged and tax free, and that. And we're going to start with Roth because the goal is to identify how much money you can keep in each one of these buckets and fill the rest of it up over here. And that's how you balance your accounts to get to a lower, significantly lower, or maybe even zero tax. So the first year, we, first tool we use is Roth. So there's two ways that we can get money to a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. Let's first talk about the benefits. So now I'm going to bring us down here. I'm trying to pay attention not to cut things off. So I'm going to make this larger so you can see it. So the first benefit of a Roth IRA or Roth 401k is after tax conversions or contributions grow tax free. So the money has already been taxed. You either tax it at the time of a conversion or you pay tax on it when you contribute to the, either the 401k or the IRA. So it's already been taxed. Now it grows tax-free in the IRA, in the Roth IRA or Roth 401k. Distributions are tax-free for you and for your heirs. People ask this all the time. Well, I get it that we won't pay tax on it. But what about our heirs? What about our kids? What about my nieces, nephews, my friends, anybody I want to pass it to? Also, no tax for the heirs. There are rules, limits, restrictions, and things to watch out for. Let's start with retirement plans. So let's make this a little larger. I have here retirement plans. If employer allows, 
more and more employers are allowing things like 401ks to have Ross, 403bs to have Ross, 457 plans can have Ross, but they don't have to. They can allow it, but they don't have to. But now um, I see more and more people having that option, and really it's unusual if they don't. Under the Secure 2.0, so Secure 2.0, which just came about this year, you can now do a simple uh, a SEP and a simple Roth IRA. That's really, really helpful. So there are plenty of people out there that don't want the complications of a 401k or a 403b plan. Uh, very few people even know what a 457 plan is, but if they're small business owners, they can use a SEP or a simple I would argue that it's just as easy to use a 401k as it is in a SEP, and you can put more money aside typically, but that's for you to decide. So let's talk about um, contribution limits. Um, oh, let me let me touch on this. So Roth 401k and Roth 403bs. Uh, under the Secure 2.0, um, now it allows for the employers to contribute to the Roth option. Um, it used to be that you could contribute, if you had a Roth option, you could contribute 100% of your contribution into the Roth option. But your employer would have to contribute into the traditional side. Now the new Secure 2.0 says employer can also contribute to the um, to the Roth side. So that's good. Very, very few plans have been able to put that into place so far, but I'm sure that they will. There's also a requirement that catch-up contributions for higher earners, that's anyone making over $145,000, um, those catch-up contributions have to go into a Roth uh, Roth option of a 401k or other retirement plan. Now, what's the benefit of that? That means more employers are going to have to offer this because if the IRS says, if you're going to have catch-up contributions for those folks over 50, right? So folks over 50, um, greater than uh, 50, is that right? Um, and uh, the uh, uh, and greater than $145,000 must go to the Roth option. That means if your employer doesn't have a Roth option or if you're an employer and you don't have a Roth option and you want to offer catch-up contributions for your employers and employees, your employees are going to want it, um, you're going to have to establish a Roth 401k. So that's good. So let's talk about contribution limits. So we got this handy dandy um, uh, chart here. You can grab this chart right from our website. I'm just going to pull our website down here for you. Let me find my mouse and pull it down. All right, here's our here's our website. So you go to education and resources here. You go to the Ed Slot corner, what I call the slot corner. It's a lot of information about me and Ed here. This section here, download free tax planning materials for 2023. You click here, you put your email address in, and you can download these tables that I'm going to show you. So let's bring this back up here. Use these resources. I have these tables up all the time, as do um, almost all of our team. So when we're talking about contribution levels, let's focus on it here. Let's talk about first 401ks and 403b plans. Here are the contribution levels for 2023. Your maximum contribution is $22,500 unless you're over 50 and then you can contribute another $7,500. That's for $30,000 in either traditional or Roth retirement plan, 403B, 401K, et cetera. So four, four, one, actually just four, one case of four, three Bs because the, uh, the distribute or the contribution levels are different. Um, so for 2023, 22,500, 7,500, uh, if you're another $7,500 catch up, if you're over 50, and remember, if you make more than $145,000 a year, now this must go into a Roth option. So you can put $30,000 a year into a Roth. And if your spouse also happens to have a Roth 401k option, then he or she can also contribute $30,000 uh, for this year into the Roth. So that is the contribution limits for the 401ks and uh, uh, four, and 403bs. Here's simple, simple IRA contributions if you have a simple plan. For 2023, it's 15500 And if you're over 50, it's a $3,500 catch-up contribution for a total of 19000 That's for a simple 
And do we have SEPs on here? SEP IRA, there it is. Um, the SEP IRA contribution limit is 25% uh, of up to a maximum $330,000 of comp, uh, compensation. SEPs are a little more confusing. Uh, limited to a maximum annual contribution of 66000 This limit also applies to KEOs and profit sharing plans. So, folks, you might say, well, wait a minute, Mark. I could put the double amount um, than I could in a, a more than double an amount what I could into a 401k. But if you're um, an employer and you have employees, you may or may not want to use a SEP because you have your matching amount um, percentage amount has to be the same for the employees as well. So these can get very expensive. Um, but if you're sole, if it's just you or maybe you and your spouse, it might be a good option for you, especially now that there's a Roth option. So worth um, worth exploring. So um, talking about contributions, no income limitations with retirement plans other than what you just saw with the SEP IRA. Certainly with the 401k and 403b, no income limitations. So you don't get phased out like you do a Roth IRA. So this is great. You could earn a million, two, three million dollars a year and still contribute to your Roth 401k and, and um, Roth 403b. So that's a real plus. So we're going to put a star here. So no contribution limits. Conversion options, very, very few. Certainly with 401k plans and 403b plans, still yet to be seen with SEPs and SIMPLES. Um, that's a very new rule. Uh, so conversion options, sometimes uh, plans, retirement plans will let you convert those funds. But uh, it's usually wrought with uh, all kinds of um, trips and hazards. You can only do it once. Uh, they won't withhold funds. Um, I've only seen very few cases where you can have a schedule of Roth conversions year over year. Um, and that's what we want usually. We want to be able to, um, going back to, let's find our buckets. Here we go. Typically what we want is we want a schedule of planned Roth conversions year over year until we get to that magic dollar amount that we want. So the first we want to focus on contributions. Can you contribute to a uh, Roth 401k plan or a Roth 403b plan or a simple or a SEP or a Roth IRA? So can you can you get money into this bucket via contributions? If you can, that's great. You want to take advantage as much as you can. The second is conversions. And conversions is simply moving money from the tax deferred bucket to the tax free bucket. It's actually a distribution that's allowable to go right into the Roth IRA. And what you have to do is pay the tax along the way. All right. So let's zoom in again down here and see where we are. The five year rule. We're coming up on the five year rule. Watch out for the five year rule. The five year rule with retirement plans and IRAs say, say that um, if your uh, contributions or conversions uh, are not in the plan for at least five years, then anything, um, uh, let me put it another way. Um, you must have at least five years in the plan for distributions to be considered tax-free. Um, so the, the growth will still continue to grow tax-free, but any distributions on that growth would consider be considered taxable if you're within the five-year rule. Again, the five-year rule is, is uh, confusing. I could spend a lot of time on that. I'm not going to. Just know this. We have a whole other video on that as well. Just know this, that if you're under 59 and a half, there's a lot of things to pay attention to. If you're over 59 and a half, it gets very, very, uh, very much, much, much easier. Um, with, with your 401k plans and 403b plans and other um, retirement plans, watch your paycheck. Because if you suddenly shift all of your contributions to a Roth uh, option in your retirement plan at work, then you're going to see less money in your paycheck. Why is that? Because you're now not get it's all it, now you're paying tax on that money. If if you um if you contribute to a traditional 401k plan, thirty thousand dollars, let's just say, um, you 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 have less of an effect because the money is not taxed yet. You're going to pay that tax money later on, but. As soon as you contribute the $30,000 into a Roth IRA, you have to pay tax on that $30,000. And where does that tax come from? Well, it usually comes out of your withholding and out of your paycheck, and uh, or it should at that point. Um, and uh, and you're going to see less money week over week or semi, semi-monthly, however you get paid. So you may want to ease into it just to see the effect 
on your paycheck because that's something many people don't think about. They say, wow, I started contributing to my Roth and I didn't realize how much it was going to drop my, my take home. So watch your paycheck. You, again, you just might want to ease into it. If 30000 is your goal, you might want to do it in increments. Or if 10000 is your goal, do it in increments. Okay, now let's talk about a Roth IRA. So that was retirement plans, right? So, uh, mostly 401ks and 403bs because they're the most popular. But let's talk about Roth IRAs. Well, there are contribution limits. Now let's go to the contribution limits. Again, the handy-dandy green forms here. So with the contribution limits, with an IRA, traditional IRA, or a Roth IRA in 2023, you can contribute $6,500. There is also a matching, or excuse me, a catch-up contribution that can be um, that if you're over 50, and uh, so 50 plus, and that can take you up to $7,500. Let's make this a little larger. So that doesn't sound too bad. You must have earned income to be able to contribute to a Roth IRA. There's things like that. But um, that's not too bad. But you get these phase-out levels with an IRA for a married filing joint um, client person, uh, $218,000. So this is your modified adjusted gross income. Um, if your modified adjusted gross income is over $218,000, uh, you start being able to contribute less to a Roth IRA. That's a phase out. Once you cross over $228,000, then you can't contribute anything to a Roth IRA, just the Roth IRA, not Roth 401ks and 403bs. Remember, there is no income phase outs for retirement plan Roth contributions. Uh, if you're a single filer or head of household, that phase out starts at 138000 to 153000 And then after that, you can't make any contributions. So that's something to pay attention to, to watch out for. Let's come back to our list. Conversion options. So we talked about contributions. Conversion options. How about anything goes? Here's the great thing about Roth um, Roth IRAs and accepting conversions. The IRS says, do what you want. Convert $1,000, convert a $1 million. We don't care. Convert it all at once. Convert it over 10 years. Convert it over five years. Convert it over 20 years. We don't care. We just want our tax. That's what they want. You figure out how much tax you want to pay and do the conversion. So now you got to go to your handy dandy uh, orange chart here and figure out your taxable income. And figure out if you're married filing jointly or if you're a single filer and you figure out where you're going to land before conversions and where you're going to land after conversions, what your tax rate's going to be. And then you figure out how much tax you're willing to pay to get that money converted and what schedule makes sense for you. Everybody's different. But again, you want to go take it from this tax deferred um, bucket to the tax free or tax advantaged bucket and usually not in one year, but usually over a schedule. And that is driven by many things. And certainly it's driven by where you're going to land with your tax rate. But that's it. Anything goes. It just depends on what's best for you. And I will say it again, that is an absolute gift from the IRS. Because if we didn't have this anything goes approach from the IRS, it would be very, very hard to get people to um, zero or tax efficient. Now, how about the five-year rule? Five-year rule exists for IRAs as well. Um, um, complicated, under 59 and a half, really, really simple, over 59 and a half. If you've had any Roth IRA for at least five years, any Roth IRA for at least five years, then any growth and any distribution of that growth is tax-free. Um, so that's, that's much simpler. Under 59 and a half, the rules are much more complex for retirement plans and IRAs. But again, we've got a whole video on that. Things to watch out for. Of course, your tax rate. You don't want to go too high. You know, we had we had people earlier in the year who said, and people get overzealous. I've seen this many, many times. Oh, I read about Roth, uh, Roth conversions. I read about tax-efficient planning. I jumped right in and converted a million dollars last year. Wow, that's probably more than you needed to do. There are cases where that makes sense. But for your average person who's got, you know, I'd say one to three million dollars in their IRAs, they may not, that may not make sense. Even you're probably going up to even a five, $5 million level. That may not make sense. But um, 
So they're probably paying a higher tax than you need to. So, so watch out for that tax rate. Ideally, we want to go take it up to the top of the 22% bracket and um, often and many times up to the top of the 24 Sometimes it makes sense to go into the 32. You heard when David McKnight was sitting in the studio here with me on uh, May 16th, I think he said, he said 32% bracket is his least favorite, but Hey, it's better than it's better than 40 to 45%, which is where we affect uh, expect uh, most people to be by 2030. So watch out for that tax rate. Watch out for tax credits. If you're expecting a tax credit and if you push your income too high, then you're going to lose that credit. So EV credits are a big thing. You can get up to $7,500. There's, there's um, uh, prohibitions on how much money you can earn now under the new Secure Act 2.0 to receive that EV credit. But there's other tax credits that you have to watch out for. Capital gains tax rate. You got to watch out for your capital gains tax rate. Yes, capital gains are, are calculated separately than those tax brackets. There's marginal tax brackets, but we have to pay attention to it. Back to our orange we're right here with our orange bracket. Here are our capital gains rates. You can have you can be taxed. I'm right up here. You can be taxed at, I'm gonna make this a little larger, this section, so you can see it. You can be taxed at 0, 15, or 20 percent. But those gradients of tax are based on your modified adjusted gross income. So you could easily go in the 15 if you're doing Roth conversions. You could also easily go into um 20 if you convert aggressively, you know, if you have some income and you do some aggressive conversions and it doesn't end at 0, 15 or 20, because you see these asterisks, there's a 3.8% Medicare surcharge uh, for anybody earning over, um, uh, it's it's usually in here, it's 250,000. Hmm. Uh, I believe it's 250,000 um, for uh, mar uh, married, uh, just uh, married single Married, finally, jointly, or, and I believe it's 200,000 uh, for single filers, but um, we'll, we'll have to confirm that. But you've got to watch out for the 3.8% surcharge because now 15% becomes 18.8 and 20 becomes 23.8. And that, when you start hitting 23.8, that makes that capital gains tax less um, efficient, right? Because it's very close to this area here that what we're showing on the right. So you got to watch out on the effect of capital gains tax. You can you can usually manage capital gains tax unless you're in mutual funds and it's much, much harder to manage those capital gains tax rates in mutual funds. Uh, but you can manage that from proper investment management. So IRMA, income-related monthly adjustment amounts. I hear this from people all the time who try to do things on their own and they say, I knew about Uncle Sam, but I didn't know about Aunt Irma, and this is costing me a lot of money. So you can go to our website and download the handy-dandy Medicare income planning uh, chart. That is a gray chart, and you can see that for a married filing joint. I'm going to make this larger. Um, uh, at 194000 and again, that's based on modified adjusted gross income. Um, there's no surcharges for um, Part B. So your total premium this year is $164.90 a month. Also, no, no surcharges on here. But once you cross over this cliff, and these are numbers if you're a single filer, right? So we'll use the single filing cliff for, for purposes here. Once you cross over $97,000 as a single filer, dollar, one, $97,001. Now you pay an extra $65.90 a month, a month. So your total premium for... Medicare Part B is $230.80 a month. And you can see the other surcharges. And so the total is 7810. Uh, so we track this really closely for clients. But if you're trying to do this on your own, there's a two-year look back. Um, so that always that always hits people too, because they think everything's running really smoothly. And then suddenly they they um they get a big Irma reduction um uh, or payment due. All right. Uh, so that's Irma. Watch out for Irma. Too much. You can convert too much. We talked about that. Um, be careful. You just Sometimes people just want to hit the gas. You can convert too much. You can convert money that never needs to be converted. Paying tax on money that you're never going to pay tax on, on, on your over your lifetime, during your lifetime, or even what you leave to heirs is, is the first thing you want to avoid. Uh, you can also convert too little. It can take you too long, and too little opens you up to tax rate risk. 
And because the longer it takes to convert, the longer you have this tax rate risk. Again, uh, we think the taxes are likely to, to um, get somewhere, begin doubling or start or, or get near double by about 2030. But that is a moving target, folks. Um, so if you're looking at this two years from now, uh, it, it might be completely different. I'm sure it will be. Um, and of course, we talked about the five-year rule, but I got to hear it again. So watch the five-year rule. All right. So that was longer than 15 minutes, but that was our financial 15. Just part one. You can see why I broke this down. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that was helpful. I know it was a lot of information. Again, our goal, where'd my buckets go? There we are. I'm zooming you folks all over the place. Our goal is to balance these buckets, have the mathematically ideal amount in this bucket, have the mathematically ideal amount in this bucket, and have everything else over to this tax-efficient bucket. The only thing truly tax-free is Roth IRAs and um, ca properly structured cash value life insurance, or as some people call them, life insurance retirement plans. And we're going to talk about those later. But uh, if you get everything balanced, you can achieve possibly the 0%. That's $0. We want 0% uh, tax bracket or minimize your, your uh, taxes substantially. And that, of course, is the goal. Step one is looking at Roth contributions and Roth conversions. And I think we covered just about everything uh, in that step today. If you have any questions, reach out to us and let's see if uh, if this will work. Well, if you reach out to us at questions at adalbertwealth.com, questions at adalbertwealth.com. If you want to schedule time with us, you can reach out to us also at questions at adalbertwealth.com. And I'd love it if you reviewed our website and you can find it at, of course, adalbertwealth.com. Um, give me your thoughts about it. It's a new site. I'm excited about it. We keep adding things um, still to be added to our, our events page. And uh, there's something else too. I can't think about it, but we're at 1104. So I'm going to let you folks go. I hope you have a great week and I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week. All right. Take care, everybody.